Hello everyone, I'm Matt Mitrich, the author and historian. Today I'm beginning a plausibility review of one of the most infamous works of alternate history of all time, The Domination of the Dragon by S.M. Sterling. Before I begin, like my other plausibility reviews, I will be focusing on a condensed version of the alternate history of the Dracoverse rather than the narrative. So while I won't spoil what happens to the individual characters, by going over the changes to history I will be spoiling much of the series, so you might want to stop watching this video in case you haven't read the book yet. Also, I want to take this moment to admit that I really actually do like these books, so please keep that in mind while you listen to my analysis. Anywho, let's begin. The Domination of Draca is a dystopian alternate history that began in 1988 with the publication of Marching Through Georgia, followed by Under the Yoke in 1989, and The Stone Dogs in 1990. The original trilogy was followed by a fourth book in 1996 titled Draca, and there was also an anthology of short stories from several different authors in 2000 titled Draca's. There was also an omnibus edition titled The Domination, which collected the first three books of the series and included a framing story. Now that we got the real world stuff out of the way, let's dig into the alternate history. In this alternate timeline, the Netherlands enters the American Revolutionary War a year early in 1779, leading to Britain capturing the Dutch possession of Cape Town that same year. When peace is finally achieved, Britain maintains control over Cape Town, and instead of settling the Loyalist and Hessian mercenaries who fought for Britain in Canada, they instead decide to send them to South Africa to form the new Crown Colony of Dracia, where the settlers intermarry with the existing Dutch Afrikaner population, which means the Draca are essentially an evil version of Canada. To be honest, I don't find that scheme to be particularly plausible. At the time, Canada was closer and strategically more important to Britain, so it makes sense that they would settle the Loyalists there. But I understand you can't have the Draca without it, so we'll let that slide for now. There is also a secondary divergence where the British are victorious at the Battle of King's Mountain. In our timeline, this was a defeat for the Loyalists led by Major Patrick Ferguson, who also died in the battle. Ferguson is the inventor of the Ferguson rifle, which was one of the first breech-loading rifles to be put into service by the British military. In the Dracoverse, however, not only are the British victorious, but Ferguson survives and his rifle sees greater use in the British army, despite the fact that it was difficult to produce and broke down easily. Except for allowing Ferguson to immigrate to Dracia, however, this does little to change the outcome of the war. As the 19th century marches on, the Crown Colony of Dracia becomes known as Draca for short, and becomes a dominion in 1858. They quickly push their way across Africa, apparently with British approval because they never once bat an eye at their colony, organizing massive campaigns of conquest and enslavement. In our timeline, British dominions were given a lot of autonomy over their own affairs, but foreign relations and military decisions were still monitored by the British. In fact, the worst part is the references to the atrocities that the Draca committed to punish slave revolts. Now, the 19th century wasn't exactly a period famous for its human rights, but Britain would quickly become a pariah state if one of their colonies were allowed to massacre people by the hundreds of thousands, and yet no negative consequences ever come out of the Draca's actions. The Draca even discovered the gold, diamonds, and other minerals South Africa is famous for long before it happened in our timeline, which is convenient since it no doubt finances their conquest of Africa. Also, there are little to no mention of the medical advances necessary to fight off the tropical diseases that were a serious problem for European settlers and their livestock in our timeline. Speaking of Europeans, the original settlers are soon joined by other white refugees, such as Icelanders fleeing volcanic eruptions, French royalists fleeing the French Revolution, and unreconstructed Confederates who rather live in Draca than give up their slaves. Oh yeah, the American Civil War still happens in this timeline, as do many other historical events. Just wait and see. As a side note, one group that doesn't appear to have immigrated to Draca are black loyalists, or the free blacks of former slaves who fought for the British during the American Revolution. In our timeline, thousands of them immigrated to Nova Scotia, although many would later immigrate to Sierra Leone when they found the climate of Canada and the reception from white Canadians to be both quite chilly. Exactly what happened to this group in the Dracaverse is unclear, but my guess is they found Canada much more appealing than Africa in this timeline. Anywho, by the time of the Great War, or World War I as we know it, begins in 1914, the Draca have completed their conquest of Africa and have slaved the entire population. Dracan slavery, like much of their culture, is inspired by classical civilization. The Draca have no concept of race-based slavery and see all non-Draca as potential property. This is based off the concept of slavery in antiquity, which was not race-based, but in those times slaves could gain freedom and even rise to a position of power, which they definitely can't in Draca society. It's explained in the book that the Draca are allowed to keep slavery into the 20th century, despite Britain abolishing slavery in 1833 throughout most of their empire and our timeline, by calling them serfs. This seems silly to me, as even if the British government turned a blind eye to what was happening in a profitable colony, abolitionists wouldn't be fooled by a marketing gimmick. They would continue to put pressure on both the British government and the Draca to abolish the practice, possibly even causing the Draca to declare independence. But they don't, and the Draca pretty much do what they want, with Britain blissfully unaware. 
Philosophically, the Draco see themselves as the master race, but not because of genetics, but because they work for it. Inspired heavily by ancient Sparta, military training for both men and women begin at childhood, and high standards of physical fitness are expected to be maintained long into adulthood. The Draca conquer and obtain power because they can, which in some respects make them very similar to the inner party of Orwell's 1984. In fact, the Draca are heavily influenced by the works of Nietzsche, who surprisingly enough exists and immigrated to Draca in this alternate timeline. I should point out that the Draca are actually pretty progressive when it comes to equality between the sexes, at least among Draca citizens. Women are treated the same as Draca men and gain many rights, including the vote and frontline service in the military, long before many other nations do in our timeline. Sex is also not taboo at all in Draca society, and the Draca are primarily bisexual, although you only ever see it in practice with Draca women, while it's only ever implied among Draca men. When it comes to sexual relations with serfs, however, Draca men are completely free to have sex with serfs whenever they want, and there's no such thing as rape, but Draca citizen can sue other citizens for damaging their property if a rape were to occur. Draca women, however, aren't allowed to have sex with male serfs until much later, when effective birth control measures are invented. Economically, the Draca appear primarily to be a nation of farmers that use a plantation system similar to America's Old South. Nevertheless, the Draca do industrialize rather quickly and develop technological breakthroughs like steam cars, dirigibles, and submarines even earlier than we did in this timeline, despite relying heavily on slave labor and central planning, which don't have a great track record for creating a successful industrialized economy. Attempts are made to explain this rapid technological advancement thanks to several smart individuals like Richard Gatling and Louis Pasteur immigrating to Draca, but the fact that many of these geniuses as we know them shouldn't even exist given the vast changes to history means this is a weak argument. A better argument could be that having Africa more developed in our timeline means that more of the world is working to advance human society, but it still requires a lot of things to go right for Draca for this to even happen. Worse, no one else seems to have this technology, not even their nominal masters, the British, and the Draca would soon war with countries that are technologically inferior to them, despite having the industrial and knowledge base to catch up with the Draca once the discoveries were known. The Draca also develop a strong anti-American sentiment and see that country as their arch enemy. In fact, American history often mirrors Dracas throughout the book. The United States industrialized quickly and conquers North America for some reason. It's never really explained why the United States was able to do this when they couldn't in our timeline. When it comes to countries like Canada, one could argue that without the Loyalist settlers, Canada would not have the population to resist American invasion in the War of 1812, but considering the United States couldn't even prevent their capital being sacked in that conflict, I'm not convinced the Loyalists were that significant to the British war effort. Believe it or not guys, I haven't even gotten to the events covered in the books. I'll get to those in part two of this plausibility review. Until then, if you like what I do, please comment, subscribe, share this video, support me on Patreon. I'm Matt Mitrich, The Alternate Historian. Bye.